we now move on to Iraq. Uh, which So Iraq is a British mandate, and right from the start, the British set it up to be a, a constitutional monarchy of sorts. And, you know, perhaps feeling a little bit bad that they hadn't supported Faisal Hussein uh, in uh, in Syria, they offer him the position of monarch. They put it to a referendum or plebiscite where, you know, all the uh, indigenous inhabitants were able to kind of vote on it. Uh, and they voted in favor of Faisal as the uh, monarch uh, in the plebiscite that was held in 1921. Uh, so, again, British probably felt that uh, you know, a, bit, a little bit guilty. They hadn't really supported him uh, when he was promoting the cause of Arab independence uh, in, in Paris. Uh, he, you know, had been thrown out of Syria by the French. Uh, on the other hand, the British really felt pretty secure that with him on the throne, British interests would be protected in the region. Uh, you know, bearing in mind, I mean, Faisal is not from Iraq. He's from Arabia. He's the son of the Sharif Hussein from the Hussein McMahon correspondence. So he doesn't have any kind of independent uh, power base in Iraq. He would really be to some degree dependent on the British maintaining a presence there. Uh, so, you know, they kind of see him as a potential client king, if you will. Uh, and so Iraq is set up pretty early on as a kind of constitutional monarchy, though initially still under uh, kind of British government, uh, finally being made independent in 1932 until then a protectorate but we you know you notice that i put independent in quotation marks there it's independent very much in the sense that the british made egypt independent in 1922 with the four reserve points uh, so the british will maintain uh, a tremendous amount of influence and even control over things like foreign policy defensive policy control over the iraqi military and definitely control over newly discovered oil resources right so you know, independent in a fashion. And the British also kind of set up things so that the Sunni Arab uh, majority in the center, right, they're not the majority in the whole country, but they're the dominant element there, will end up being a kind of governing elite. Uh, and this is very typical of kind of British colonial policy, right? It's just kind of like, you know, really trying to uh, accentuate differences between different peoples in a colony, you know, whether it's Hindu versus Muslim in India, for instance, or different uh, African tribes in African colonies, and then pretty much putting one of them at the top uh, of the political hierarchy, right, so that they kind of, uh, in a sense, are held in place by virtue of British support, and then in return, they will uh, pretty much ensure that British interests are protected. So in this case, they pretty, pretty much put all their chips on the Sunni Arab uh, uh, constituent. Uh, so there are a number of, you know, there's uh, many different ways in which they kind of strengthen their position, but three that really stand out. So on the one hand, you have the Land Settlement Act, which basically gives Sunni tribal sheikhs the right to register communal tribal lands in their own names. Uh, and so historically, very often, there had been kind of an understanding that this, you know, like large uh, area of land belonged to the entire tribe. Uh, and, you know, but very often the tribal sheikh would represent the tribal interests in that capacity. So here they're actually now registering uh, that land in their own names, which means that they effectively own it uh, and might choose to ignore any communal rights that the rest of the tribe had. What you end up doing here is creating kind of a political elite, a kind of very wealthy land-owning elite that will dominate the political system. Uh, they further strengthen the Sunni tribal sheikhs by... Uh, through something called the Tribal Disputes Regulations, which pretty much gives them uh, control of, you know, any kind of judiciary that might evolve, right? They have kind of special judiciary rights that are now kind of set in stone. And at the same time, they, they do things to weaken the position of the larger peasantry. For instance, peasants, the Peasants' Rights and Duties Act severely reduces the rights of tenants, right? So all of this is really about creating a kind of Sunni Arab political elite that the British are confident will represent British interests. And British interests are very rapidly uh, becoming tied to the discovery of a very important resource in the region. Uh, so you know, they discover oil in 1927 in the north in the area around Kirkuk, uh, and almost immediately exploration rights are granted to the Iraqi Petroleum Company. Don't let the name fool you, it is a British dominated company. Uh, meaning that the British will control that resource. Later on, they will discover oil 
in the Persian Gulf as well. Uh, and even before that, Iraq was seen as strategically important because of the importance of India, right? So this kind of gave the British direct access to the Persian Gulf. Uh, and, uh, you know, by the way, given that they also have uh, the mandate for Palestine inclusive of Jordan, that effectively means that the British have a land bridge from the Mediterranean straight over to the Persian Gulf. Well, uh, shortly after Iraq becomes quote-unquote independent, uh, Faisal is going to die uh, at a rather young age. He becomes ill, ends up dying at a hospital uh, in Switzerland. He is succeeded by his son, Razi, who will be king from 1933 to 1939, following his death in a motor car accident. And uh, Razi was something of a kind of playboy, you know, kind of uh, the classic playboy, right? Racing fast cars, chasing women around. And so he dies in a motor car accident. Uh, unfortunately, uh, his son at that point uh, was much too young to take the throne. So acting as regent will be his cousin and brother-in-law, Abd al-Ilah, uh, who will govern until Razi's son comes of age in 1953. So, you know, so for a while, this new dynasty, Husseini dynasty, beginning with Faisal, is kind of working out, uh, at least superficially, right? From the British point of view, everything seems fine. But in actual fact, uh, you're, you're really seeing uh, the development of a lot of problems that are going to greatly undermine support for this monarchy, kind of growing corruption. Uh, you have a number of very powerful families that emerge on top, and so political positions just kind of rotate back and forth between them. Uh, none of them represent any kind of ideological political party or, you know, or some way are trying to promote the welfare of the Iraqi people or even promote the idea of an Iraqi national identity, mostly looking out for their own individual interest. Right? So this is really kind of you know, laying the foundations for uh, down the road you know, some kind of uprising. We'll come to that in a bit, but let us look at what might be the most interesting uh, mandate during this period, and that would be Palestine, which again initially includes uh, what today constitutes the nation of Jordan. <laughs> Excuse me. So first of all, as with the other mandates, the British are obligated to prepare the indigenous inhabitants for eventual self-government and independence. But and this is unique to the mandate for Palestine, the terms of the Balfour Declaration are actually incorporated into the mandate. This is legitimized internationally via the League of Nations. So in addition to preparing the local population for independence, the British also are obligated to uh, lay the groundwork for a Jewish national home, right? And that was at the heart of the Balfour Declaration. Uh, and so we have the the actual declaration here that you might review, and reminding you that the Balfour Declaration really didn't uh, say anything about uh, protecting or certainly not promoting the political rights of the non-Jewish, quote-unquote, non-Jewish communities in Palestine, right? So they're not even recognized as a distinct people, Palestinian Arabs. And uh, you know, I should point out, I think we mentioned this, at the beginning of the mandate, only about 10% of the population in Palestine is Jewish. Uh, so what does that mean in practice as far as, you know, this idea that the British are obligated to support the creation of a national home for the Jewish people? It basically means two things in practice. On the one hand, uh, the British must facilitate the ability of Jews to immigrate to Palestine, primarily from Europe. Uh, and it's going to be uh, pretty slow going initially. The vast majority of Jews in the world at this point don't support Zionism, the idea of a kind of Jewish nation state, or that the, even that the Jews are somehow a distinct nation of people. Uh, so you're going to have kind of, you know, roughly, you know, seven, eight, nine, maybe 10,000 Jews per year, and many of them eventually leaving after they find it to be much rougher going than they anticipated. Uh, the second part is facilitating the ability of Jews to purchase land. There's kind of this idea that, you know, over an extended period of time, uh, wealthy Jews, uh, very often it might be institutions created for that purpose, uh, you know, various kinds of foundations and so forth, to, you know, incrementally purchase as much land as they can throughout Palestine, and then to establish settlements there. Uh, many of these are agricultural settlements, uh, initially known as kibbutzim. Uh, later you have Moshevim. Kibbutzim is kind of operating on communist principles where everything is kind of jointly owned by the settlers. Moshevim is kind of allowing for 
a greater degree of private property. Uh, and there's kind of this idea that, you know, if Jews are going to be, you know, like truly a nation and somehow, you know, have some kind of right to Palestine, they kind of need to get their hands into the soil and learn to become farmers. Uh, and until that point, actually, most Jews, particularly coming from Europe, had very little agricultural experience. And the majority of them are actually going to go to cities like Jerusalem, Haifa, uh, and a newly created city called Tel Aviv, just to the north of Jaffa. Right? And that actually only began at the very end of the 19th century, literally built on the sand. So the first high commissioner of Palestine, representing British authority, is going to be a fellow named Sir Herbert Samuel, who governs between 1920 and 1925. And uh, right from the get-go, this really sends out a powerful signal to Palestine's Arabs. Right? So Sir Herbert Samuel is both Jewish and a known supporter of Zionism. Right? So, uh, you know, granted, he takes great pains to demonstrate his neutrality, uh, you know, really trying to show that he is cognizant of Arab interests, that he's trying to find some kind of balance between the two. Uh, but obviously, if you're a Palestinian Arab, uh, the fact that he's Jewish and Zionist just doesn't bode well for the future. Nonetheless, if the, you know, the first uh, five years of the mandate under his commissionership are relatively peaceful. Uh, some credit him uh, and you know, the fact that he, he's perceived as being fair as a factor uh, behind that. I would argue it really has more to do with that, at least initially, Palestine's Arabs feel that the best course of action is to peacefully protest, you know, either through peaceful demonstrations uh, or petitions or sending delegations to London to try and convince the British uh, that their policy is misguided. And there's this kind of idea that the British are ultimately fair. Uh, the problem is they just don't really understand what they're doing. If you can help them to understand how unfair uh, you know, supporting the Balfour Declaration is, and they'll eventually change their position. Uh, so, for instance, at some point, an Arab delegation will uh, be presented before the Minister of Colonial Affairs, the Colonial Secretary, as it was, a fellow named Winston Churchill at the time. You may have heard of him. Uh, and, you know, they, they, before they can even speak, he basically, uh, Churchill indicates, listen, I, we know exactly what the policy is. We know exactly your position. And there's no point even speaking because nothing is going to change in that regard. Uh, and as you might imagine, that came as a bit of a shock. It, it was no small thing for a delegation of Arabs from Palestine to make their way to London at that point. Winston Churchill actually showed up in Palestine shortly thereafter in 1922. Uh, I might note alongside T. Lawrence. Uh, in theory, to kind of clarify what a Jewish national home was. There was a great deal of confusion about that, like whether it was supposed to be uh, just designating that Jews would have some kind of political status in, in Palestine or part of Palestine would be a Jewish state, all of Palestine, and so forth. Uh, suffice it to say, so I mean, whatever, what, what Winston Churchill said actually was effectively a statement of British policy. Uh, and it actually left people more confused about what a Jewish national home was than before uh, he actually said anything. And that probably was the intention. Winston Churchill uh, certainly was a brilliant speaker, and if he wanted to clarify uh, what British policy was in that respect, uh, he certainly could have done so. Uh, one aspect, however, of this new policy was that all territory in Palestine uh, east of the Jordan River would be off limits to Zionism. So effectively severing off what became Transjordan, today what we call the Kingdom of Jordan, um, and it would come under a different kind of administration. Uh, the British put uh, Abdullah bin al Hussein, the brother of Faisal, in charge of his administration, uh, partly to uh, dissuade him from attacking the French in Syria, which he was about to do. He had kind of uh, set up a base in uh, the village of Amman uh, in what today is Jordan, what today is in fact the capital. And they basically were like, you know, just kind of leave the French alone. We'll put you in charge of uh, Transjordan. And so he held the rank of emir or prince, uh, but it was still under ultimate British authority. Uh, Jordan would finally become independent under his rule uh, in 1946, at which point he became the king of the Heshemite kingdom of Jordan. Uh, the Hussein family claiming to be descended from the same clan as Muhammad, the Heshemite clan. 
Uh, and by the way, I mean, that is still the ruling dynasty in Jordan today. As for the rest of Palestine, tensions were beginning to grow uh, between the uh, Jewish population and the Arab population. Uh, in fact, you know, really at this point, uh, you're coming into the late 1920s, it wasn't really clear that Zionism was going to succeed. Uh, there, there really weren't a tremendous number of Jews coming to Palestine. In fact, in 1928, more left than actually came in. Uh, that did kind of hold out the promise of arriving at a compromise. On the other hand, many, many of the Zionists who were, were setting up in Palestine were extremely uh, radical, not open to compromise. Uh, many of them were quite upset about the fact that Jordan had been uh, kind of severed off from uh, Palestine what would become the state of Jordan. Uh, and so you started to see kind of growing tensions uh, with kind of demonstrations, counter demonstrations. A lot of these actually started centering around the Haram al-Sharif. Uh, and that is the holiest site uh, uh, or the third holiest site for Muslims, right? And this is supposedly the, the point from which Muhammad had uh, gone up to heaven in connection with his night journey. And that's where the Dome of the Rock is located. But that also was the original site of the ancient Jewish temple. Uh, and so, you know, that had been destroyed by the Romans in 70 AD. Uh, but the containment wall uh, that had kind of surrounded the platform upon which the temple had been built and upon which now is located the Al-Aqsa Mosque and the, uh, the Dome on the Rock, uh, Part of that wall had, you know, had survived uh, the destruction of the temple and had become very sacred to the Jews, the Western Wall, where many Jews would go to pray and where it was considered that the presence of God could still be found. Uh, so, you know, having demonstrations around this kind of contested holy site, even if it was to some degree on more nationalistic grounds, uh, definitely did a lot to heighten tensions. And eventually it led to uh, what are known as the Wailing Wall Riots or Disturbances in August of 1929. Uh, so a rumor had started to spread that the Jews had designs on the Haram al-Sharif, that they, they were on the verge of convincing the British to give it all to them. Uh, and so, you know, passions were uh, highly incensed. And then uh, many Muslims, when coming out of the Friday noon prayer uh, at the Al-Aqsa Mosque in the Haram al-Sharif, uh, basically went on a rampage, massacring large numbers of Jews. Uh, things got really uh, especially bad in Jerusalem and the not-so-far-away town of Hebron. And in the end, about 133 Jews were killed, 339 others injured, uh, and large numbers of Arabs were killed as well, though mostly by British police who were trying to kind of quell the disturbances. You, you, you saw 110 Arabs killed and 232 injured. Uh, and the British responded basically by sending a commission to try and figure out what the causes of the riots were. What they determined was that ultimately it was not really about religion, it was not premeditated, it was largely nationalistic in origin. So here you can see, uh, just so we know what we're talking about, uh, the Dome of the Rock, which is kind of the, the main edifice uh, on top of what had formerly been the Temple Mount, and as part of a complex known as Haram al-Sharif, or Noble Sanctuary. Uh, so it pretty much encompasses the entire surface of what had been the Temple Mount. Uh, the other main structure is the Al-Aqsa Mosque. The Dome of the Rock, in fact, is not a mosque. It marks the point from, from which Muhammad alighted to heaven, uh, according to the uh, account of his night journey. Uh, the actual mosque is at one end uh, of that complex. And you can see uh, what had been the containment wall of the Temple Mount, uh, all that remained from the original structure from when the Romans had destroyed the temple. Uh, and the Western Wall in particular, beginning somewhere around the 13th century, has started to become a kind of holy spot for Jews. You could argue today is probably the holiest, holiest place for Jews in the world. Uh, this kind of idea developed that the presence of God uh, was somehow still there. Uh, so a very uh, common image, you'll see Jews praying there, writing uh, prayers on little pieces of paper, putting them between the stones. I've had the pleasure of, of visiting uh, both of these sites numerous times. And if uh, you know, we were having class in person, I could tell you some pretty good stories about my encounter with Michael Jackson there 
uh, later on Latoya Jackson a few weeks later. Uh, so I have this kind of special Jackson Western Wall connection. I'm not sure how that came about. Uh, but in any event, uh, I, I don't think we can really get into that here. But Palestine's Arabs at some point decided the problem wasn't really the Jews. The problem was more the British and British policy. And they certainly you know, had become completely disillusioned that they were going to persuade the British to re reverse their policy through peaceful means. Uh, and so this uh, eventually led to what's known as the Great Revolt uh, of 1936-1939. It started with a general strike, uh, which was deemed illegal by the British, so they, they basically tried to break it down. Uh, and then it very quickly escalated into a nationwide revolt. And again, it was primarily directed against the British, though certainly many Jews ended up being targeted as well. Uh, eventually, the British were able to militarily suppress it, uh, and they really engaged in some pretty harsh tactics, including uh, the collective punishment of villagers, uh, you know, of villages, any village that, you know, ha was deemed to be harboring, uh, from the British point of view, terrorists, from the Palestinian point of view, freedom fighters, uh, they would target the whole village. Uh, and certainly there were, were many episodes of, you know, the British using torture, uh, execution, so forth. Uh, and eventually they were able to suppress the revolt. They had many of the leaders of the, of the revolt were sent into exile. Uh, and then came the Second World War. Uh, and in some ways, the British were quite lucky. I mean, things really did settle down, so they didn't really have to deal with, uh, you know, trying to maintain control and using up military resources in Palestine. After the war, uh, things would escalate again, though this time coming from the Jewish side. And in fact, many Jews in Palestine had actually fought alongside the British during the Second World War, kind of hoping that the British would view their cause more favorably. In fact, the British had actually started to curtail uh, the number of Jew Jews that would be allowed to immigrate to Palestine. Uh, and and they, they were beginning to recognize that they were going to have to somehow take into account Palestinian Arab nationalist aspirations. Uh, so after the war, uh, particularly uh, those Zionists far to the right politically, uh, basically felt that, you know, I mean, by this point, the Jewish population was much larger. Uh, the, the, the Jews in Palestine had actually started developing the institutions of government uh, so that if they were to become independent, they could pretty much hit the ground running. They'd even developed... Uh, what effectively was an army. So it's kind of a feeling like, you know, we're ready to, you know, kind of, you know, just deal with this on our own. We just need the British to get out of the way. Uh, and so among other things, you had some very militant right-wing Zionist groups that engaged in, and there's really no other name for it, terrorist actions against the British. Uh, like, for instance, they might kidnap British soldiers, uh, basically, uh, torture and kill them and leave their bodies hanging from trees and things of that nature. Probably the most famous uh, terrorist incident visited upon the British was the bombing of the King David Hotel uh, on July 22, 1946. This was carried out by members of a militant organization known as the Irgun, uh, the head of which, Menachem Begin, would one day become Prime Minister of Israel. In any event, they set off a bomb. Uh, why the King David Hotel? Because a big part of it housed the offices uh, of the British Palestine government. Uh, more specifically, the British Secretariat, uh, Secretariat, the Military Command, and a branch of the Criminal Investigation Division, uh, you know, basically the police. Uh, so they set off a bomb exploding those offices, killing 91 people, uh, most of them staff of the Secretariat, but also of the hotel. Uh, among these, 28 were British, 41 Arab, 17 Jewish, and five others. Uh, around 45 people were injured. Uh, and certainly after the Second World War, uh, the British were becoming really frustrated about what to do with the situation in Palestine. Uh, you know, for the longest time, they really imagined that it would be possible to reconcile uh, uh, Zionist and Palestinian Arab nationalist claims. And I think they finally began to realize that there was just no way you could somehow satisfy both parties. And eventually they decided just to turn the problem over to a newly created international organization, the United Nations. Uh, so the UN appointed a committee uh, known as UNESCO uh, 
Uh, it was composed of representatives from 11 states, none of which were great powers, right? There was kind of a feeling that uh, the great powers all had too much of a vested interest in the Middle East and could not be impartial. Uh, and so, you know, their job was to come up with a solution to resolve the this kind of evolving conflict between the Jews and Arabs in Palestine. What they came up with was a partition plan in 1947. Uh, basically, the idea was to divide up Palestine and create two states, an independent Arab state and an independent Jewish state, based on, you know, whoever constituted the majority and which, in whichever region, right? And so you ended up with this map that we see here. Uh, the yellow areas would be part of an Arab state. The orange areas would be part of a Jewish state. Jerusalem would be placed under international administration. It was just simply too important uh, to both parties to divide uh, and to, you know, uh, many different religious groups around the world. And finally, on November 29th, the UN General Assembly voted in favor of partition, 33 to 13, with 10 abstentions. Uh, and it's, I believe, the only time that the United States and the Soviet Union voted the same way, uh, in this case in favor of partition, uh, on a UN uh, resolution brought before the General Assembly. Uh, so finally, uh, well, the Zionists accepted the partition plan. Uh, the Palestinian Arabs rejected it. Uh, and I should point out, to, some would argue, and I think somewhat fairly, that the Zionists agreed to it because they knew that the Palestinian Arabs would say no. So it's like, why not look like the reasonable party here? right? The, the truth of the matter is that neither side wanted uh, partition. Uh, certainly the Zionists were quite sure that once the British were out of the way, that militarily uh, they could acquire more territory than what was being promised in the partition plan. And in fact, when the British finally left Palestine, almost immediately uh, the Jews in Palestine declared their independence, the independence of a new Israeli state. That was on May 14th. And almost immediately they went to war, but not with Palestine's Arabs, with the neighboring Arab states. In fact, Palestine's Arabs pretty much just got out of the way, often at the behest uh, of the different Arab states, but also in part because as soon as the war began, uh, the Israeli army tried to acquire as much territory as possible, and that meant trying to uh, force as many of Palestine's Arabs out of their villages, out of territory that they wanted to be part of the newly created Israeli state. So this was the uh, first major conflict between Israel and the Arab states. Uh, some would call it the Arab-Israeli uh, War of 1948-49. Uh, the Israelis call it the War of Independence. Uh, suffice it to say, when the dust finally settled, this is what you had. Uh, now we should know, right? At the time, it was kind of depicted as a, uh, you know, kind of David versus Goliath story. Little Israel versus the collective might of the Arab states. Uh, most people who are familiar with the military situation on the ground at the time would, would, would actually contend uh, that Israel was in a pretty good situation. I mean, their military was actually in many ways already superior to what the Arabs could offer. Uh, also, the Arabs really had trouble kind of coordinating their attack. Uh, you could see a case of too many top chefs, not enough sous chefs. Nobody wanted to put their army under the command of another Arab state. Uh, suffice it to say that when the dust finally settled, the newly created Israeli state was considerably bigger uh, than what had been promised in the partition plan. Uh, so you can see it kind of laid out in blue. Uh, the only parts of Palestine, Palestine that they didn't uh, acquire, uh, on, on the one hand, you had what's uh, since come to be known as the West Bank, as in the West Bank of the Jordan River. Uh, that would be incorporated into Jordan and not really indicated on this map, at least in terms of color coding. Uh, a strip of territory around the city of Gaza, which you do see there, known as the Gaza Strip, which would end up under Egyptian control, and Jerusalem became a divided city, with the western half under Israeli control, and the eastern half, including the old city, the oldest part of the city, under Jordanian control. So we already mentioned uh, how the, uh, the defeat of the Arab states during this first uh, encounter with Israel had proved to be very humiliating for their governments, particularly in Egypt, and that had led to a military coup uh, that brought this fellow to power, Gamal Abdel Nasser. Uh, 
who will very quickly become the hero, the major figure of Pan-Arabism. Uh, so becoming very popular, not just in Egypt, but throughout the Arab world. And you might remember uh, at an earlier point, we were kind of discussing, you know, is Egypt part of the Middle East? Is it part of the Arab world? Is it something distinct? Definitely during the 50s and 60s, Egyptians feel that they are Arab, uh, that the, they aspire to be part of a unified Arab state. Uh, so Nasser becomes the hero of what we call pan-Arabism, right? This idea of uniting all the Arab states. And probably the event that really brings him to the fore, uh, brings him to the fore in this regard, is the Suez Crisis, right? So uh, this is a kind of what became an international crisis centered around the Suez Canal. Uh, so what happened? Uh, so Nasser is in power. He's president of Egypt. And from a pretty, pretty early point, this is during the Cold War, Right, two things. One, he makes it clear that Egypt doesn't want to belong to either camp in the Cold War. You know, United States and Soviet Union uh, are, you know, among other aspects of it, is kind of an ideological conflict. The one promoting capitalism and democracy, the other communism, uh, and both are putting pressure, uh, particularly on many of these kind of newly independent, formerly colonized states, to pick sides. Right. This is also the period of decolonization when the British and French are basically having to relinquish their empires, and partly because they're completely broke after the Second World War, uh, partly because the demand for independence is, is just not to be denied at this point. So Nasser's like, I'm pursuing a policy of neutrality. I'm happy to deal with either the United States or the Soviet Union, uh, but we will not be beholden to either. And at the same time, he wants to rapidly modernize Egypt. Oh, that sounds like a familiar theme. Uh, and the problem is really the only source of revenue for this is either the Egyptian government. I mean, you simply don't have a big enough private sector, large enough middle class that they could actually fund uh, kind of rapid modernization, uh, you know, in terms of industrialization, building factories and building up the economy. Uh, or you'd have to borrow money from abroad. And uh, considering what had happened with Ismail and the dual financial control, uh, I think it's easy to understand why Egyptians might not want to go down that route. So Nasser is basically going to adopt a policy of socialism at home. Um, again, not because they're sympathetic to communism, but really the government is, is the only place where you're going to get revenue in order to rapidly modernize the state. Now, from the point of view of the United States, uh, they're not happy about either of these developments, right? I mean, socialism at home sounds too much like communism. Uh, neutrality abroad, well, the head uh, of the Department of State, a fellow named Dulles at this point, he's what we call a cold warrior hawk. Uh, from his point of view, either you're with us or you're against us, right? So, you know, neutrality, we're not buying it. From our point of view, it's as good as if you're, uh, you know, in the Soviet camp. Uh, and so the United States had actually uh, been working on a, a deal to sell military equipment to Egypt. Uh, and in response to these developments, they decide to hold it up, right? Even though they had already been agreed, uh, these military sales, kind of as a punishment or, you know, pressure to kind of force Nasser into the American camp. Nasser is having none of it. In September 1955, uh, he's like, you don't want to sell me arms. I'll go to Czechoslovakia. Well, from the point of view of people like Dulles, uh, to some degree the American president at the time, Eisenhower, that just confirms their worst fears. Czechoslovakia is part of the Soviet camp. It's behind the Iron Curtain. It's a, basically a Soviet satellite state. From their point of view, that's as good as if you're buying arms from the Soviet Union. Well, the United States responds now by putting pressure on the World Bank to withdraw its offer to help finance the construction of the Aswan High Dam. This dam was going to be the centerpiece of Egypt's modernization program. It would, uh, you know, utilize uh, the Nile River in order to produce a large amount of electricity. And Nasser is obviously pretty upset by this. Uh, and he responds by nationalizing the privately owned Suez Canal Company. A perfectly legal move, right, is now going to use the, the revenue generated by the canal to fund the construction of the dam. But this is really going to tick off the British in particular, uh, who even though they're kind of losing their empire and they've already lost India, 
you know, old habits die hard. The Suez Canal had been seen as the lifeline of the British Empire. Uh, the British are still coming to terms with the fact that they are no longer a great imperial power. Uh, and they see this as a kind of slap in the face. And so they're going to basically collude with two other powers, or one newly arrived state, uh, in order to attack Egypt. Uh, and these two other countries are going to be, on the one hand, France, uh, which right now, at this point, is also upset with Egypt because Egypt is supporting uh, Algerian nationalists against them, Algeria, a colony of the French. Uh, and so the Egyptians are providing uh, military assistance uh, to the Algerians. Uh, and uh, the other country is Israel. Uh, Israel is kind of upset because, uh, on the one hand, Egypt is threatening not to let Israel use the Suez Canal. Uh, they're also blocking Israel's access to, uh, at this point, its only major port in the very south of the country uh, that would have to go through the uh, Red Sea uh, in order to access it. And also they are sponsoring militant raids uh, from Gaza uh, by Palestinian Arabs that like go into Israel, conduct militant attacks from Israel's point of view, terrorist attacks, uh, and then escape back across the border. Uh, so the three of them come together uh, in a kind of collusion and come up with a plan uh, in order to attack Egypt. And this will be the campaign in Sinai of 1956. So it's a collusion. What, what we mean by that is that they are kind of secretly mapping it out, a kind of a plan that will allow the British and French to take control of the Suez Canal. And uh, from the British point of view, they're hoping it might even incite a kind of military overthrowing of Nasser. Right? So the basic plan is this. Israel will attack Egypt across the Sinai Peninsula, will march on the Suez Canal. The British and French will act completely surprised as if they had no idea this was going to happen. We'll then call upon both the Egyptians and the Israelis to withdraw from the canal, right? supposedly to separate these two belligerent powers and to secure the, the Suez Canal, which is important internationally. Uh, they anticipate that the Egyptians will refuse, at which point they will then have a pretext for militarily occupying the canal zone, uh, basically uh, parachuting troops into the canal zone. And from a military point of view, it, the, the whole plan goes, goes off uh, without a hitch. Uh, the problem is everybody sees through it, including the United States, uh, who first of all had, uh, Eisenhower had indicated to, to the British Prime Minister Anthony Eden many times that they did not favor a military response to the national, nationalizing of the canal. Uh, they felt that this would alienate many recently uh, you know, decolonized states, which would then uh, provide an opportunity for the Soviet Union uh, to kind of you know, pull them into their camp. Um, in any event, Eisenhower was furious that the British had gone ahead with this. It was pretty clear that this had all been kind of planned in advance. Uh, it's even kind of threatening to pull the Soviet Union uh, into a much broader conflict. Uh, so the United States, uh, for the most part, the United States, to some degree the Soviet Union, put pressure on all three parties to withdraw. And this ends up actually being very humiliating for the British. Uh, in particular. The French were like, okay, we gave it a shot, didn't work out. They didn't really care. Uh, Israelis kind of had a similar attitude, but for the British, this was very humiliating. They were pretty much put in their place by the United States. Uh, and in fact, Anthony Eden is forced to step down as prime minister when Eisenhower makes it clear that he will not deal with him in any way, shape, or form. For Egypt, this is a tremendous, tremendous diplomatic victory. Uh, more specifically for Nasser, who is seen now as this kind of hero of Pan-Arabism. He had stood up uh, against the former imperial powers of Britain and France, and he had prevailed. Um, so from this point on, he is kind of the leading hero of Pan-Arabism. Uh, and the ultimate goal of Pan-Arabism is to see the different Arab states eventually become united into one huge Pan-Arab state. Uh, and there really is kind of a period where it looks like it might happen. Uh, in fact, it begins with a union between Egypt and Syria. Uh, and so, you know, imagine that you're an Arab nationalist in any part of the Arab world, right? I mean, like you see that Egypt and Syria have become united. 
they become the United Arab Republic. Uh, and you really kind of imagine this is only a first step. So now you're kind of clamoring for your government to move in the same direction. So Nasser really becoming this massively popular figure throughout the Middle East. But as it turns out, uh, this really isn't a first step to kind of the unification of all Arab states. Uh, the union between Syria and Egypt only lasts for three years, 1958 to 1961. Uh, you know, in part, again, the problem of too many top chefs, not enough sous chefs. Uh, political figures in Syria kind of resent that they're being forced to, um, uh, you know, kind of take direction from Egypt. I mean, it's pretty clear that the Egyptians are in charge. Nasser is the guy at the top. Uh, and so it kind of falls apart. Nonetheless, Nasser will remain influential in all of the Arab states pretty much up through 1967. And here you can kind of see, uh, you know, the, this United Arab Republic. Uh, it's kind of interesting. Egypt continues to call itself the United Arab Republic, uh, even after uh, Syria breaks away. Uh, so there's still kind of the idea that maybe somewhere down the road this is still going to happen. We should note as well that Nasser is not just a hero of the Arab world, he is a hero of, of Asia and Africa, of all the non-great power states. Um, you know, many of them only newly independent with the collapse of the British and French empires. Uh, and so he becomes kind of one of the founding members of an organization known as the Non-Aligned Movement which consists of 100, uh, over 100 states and, you know, basically all of them saying that they don't want to be forced to pick sides in the Cold War. Uh, and this uh, non-aligned movement originates at a conference in Bandung, Indonesia in 1955. Uh, and again, declaring their desire not to become involved in the Cold War. We're happy to deal with, you know, the United States, the Soviet Union, with whoever, but please do not dictate to us uh, you know, who our friends are, who we can trade with, and so forth. And again, Nasser is one of the founding fathers of, uh, you know, kind of the short for form of this is NAM. Uh, so he becomes one of five prominent world leaders in the, uh, what at that time they referred to as the third world, right? So it's him, uh, Nehru of India, Tito of Yugoslavia, which is communist but refused to be a Soviet puppet state, uh, Sukarno of Indonesia, uh, and the Kruma uh, of Ghana. So the next major conflict between uh, Israel and the neighboring Arab states would be the Six-Day War of 1967, as the name implies. It was a rather uh, short war, limited duration. And this is a conflict that really nobody wanted uh, it was a consequence of kind of a tit-for-tat escalation of tensions. Uh, and, you know, while I, I, I'm certainly never reluctant to take a critical view of Israel and its interaction, uh, interactions with its neighbors, certainly with Palestinians, uh, th this is one case where I, I think you could, uh, you could argue that Israel was justified, uh, noting that Israel actually is the one that initiates the conflict. Uh, but what I mean is, in a sense, that from, from their perspective, it, it seemed that war was imminent and they had no choice. And the simple fact is that Israel, for a number of reasons, can't afford to fight a war of long duration or a war of attrition. Um, so there are two specific factors I would highlight in that regard. First of all, Israel geographically a very narrow country. Uh, and particularly when the West Bank was under Jordanian control, and if you look at the map in the center there, I'm not sure it's very clear, uh, but there is, you know, at some point where the West Bank actually comes within 10 miles of the Mediterranean. Uh, so if the, if the collective Arab states are fighting against Israel, probably their, their immediate objective would be to literally sever I Israel in half. Uh, and given that you have this kind of uh, area uh, where the West Bank kind of juts uh, out towards the Mediterranean, where Israel was very narrow, uh, this is a real possibility. Uh, so for, you know, for Israel to kind of sit around and wait for the other side to attack first uh, could be fatal. Added to which, Israel's population, you know, particularly if it's fighting all of the Arab states, is relatively small. Uh, some of you might know that even until today, all Israelis, including women, have to do military service, right? So they, they have a draft. It's not a volunteer army. 
uh, and uh, the men are in the reserve for a very extended period of time after their military service. The idea being that you know, if a war is, uh, were to commence, then you call up the reserve. So pretty much all the men end up fighting, meaning also that the economy ends up pretty much coming to a standstill. And the longer the war goes on, uh, the more of a problem, the more of a drain this becomes uh, on Israel. So for them, if they're going to fight a war, they really need, and, and if they're going to be victorious, they really kind of need to make sure the war doesn't carry on too long. Uh, so why did Israel feel that war was imminent? Some of this had to do with the fact, uh, you could say Nasser was a victim of his own success. You know, as he became a much more prominent voice, uh, speaking on behalf of all the Arabs, uh, on behalf of Pan-Arabism, um, you know, there's kind of increasing pressure on him to put his money where his mouth is, particularly in terms of his pronouncements about Israel uh, and, you know, his claim to support the Palestinian cause, which would have been kind of the preeminent Arab cause at the time. Uh, so what happens, a number of moves that he make are actually going to convince Israel that war is imminent. Uh, so you might notice that photo in the lower left-hand corner is Nasser with uh, King Hussein, the grandson of Abdullah, now the ruler of Jordan, uh, who was actually compelled to sign a military alliance with Egypt, that in the event of war, uh, Jordan would uh, fight alongside Egypt. Uh, I say compelled, he was literally kidnapped in Amman, the capital of Jordan, flown to Cairo and forced to sign the agreement. Uh, so, you know, obviously that was one thing that Egypt did, convincing Israel that war was, uh, you know, something very likely to happen. Uh, probably more important, uh, after 1956, the UN has sent peacekeeping uh, troops to occupy Sinai to act as a kind of buffer between Israeli and Egyptian forces, right, to prevent them from fighting. It's actually the first time the UN ever did this, uh, the so-called Blue Helmets. Uh, so Egypt, uh, at, at some point shortly before the war, uh, tells the UN that he wants those troops taken out. And so they're removed. I mean, Sinai, after all, being Egyptian territory. Uh, and in their place, uh, Nasser mobilizes the Egyptian army right up to the border of Israel. So at some point, it seems almost inevitable that war is going to happen, and the decision is made uh, for a preemptive strike. Uh, and in, in large measure, because of how successful this was, uh, Israel is going to be victorious within six days. The first thing they do is they basically completely annihilate the Egyptian Air Force while it's still on the ground. Uh, after that, it's almost a foregone conclusion. Um, and so Israel is going to very rapidly conquer a tremendous amount of territory, probably nothing more important than, uh, from the Israeli point of view, the liberation, quote-unquote, of uh, eastern Jerusalem from, from Jordanian control. And you might see the uh, photo... Uh, photos in the lower right-hand corner are of Israeli troops moving into Jerusalem, and probably the, the one to the far right that's one of the most famous photos associated with this period, uh, where you have these Israeli soldiers looking on in bewilderment at the Western Wall, uh, the holiest site for Jews, to which they hadn't had access since 49. Um, but it's going to be a good deal more than that. By the time the dust has settled, uh, Israel has conquered all of the Sinai, the West Bank, the Gaza Strip, and from Syria, territory known as the Golan Heights, uh, and of course, Jerusalem. Uh, so, you know, I mean, this is just by any measure a, a, an utter uh, humiliating military defeat for the Arab states, uh, in particular for Nasser. He actually uh, is so... Uh, uh, despondent after this that he offers to resign from the office of president. Uh, the only thing that keeps him in office, the Egyptian people take to the streets and demand that he doesn't resign. Uh, but it's pretty much the end of his career. Three years later, he's going to die from a stroke. Uh, and in many ways, it kind of marks the beginning of the end for pan-Arabism, right? This kind of idea of a, you know, a striving for a unified Arab state. Uh, many Palestinians from this point on are going to decide that they have to take matters into their own hands instead of waiting for, you know, the kind of unified Arab forces to liberate them. Uh, but, but this is really going to change the dynamic in the Middle East in, in many profound ways. And we'll come back to this in a bit. Let us look at developments in Syria, right? So up until the union with Egypt, 
Uh, you m might remember Syria became independent right after the Second World War, but they, they were never really politically stable. Uh, the president at the time of Syria's union with Egypt, Shukri uh, al um, uh that pretty much, he was probably the most prominent political figure up until then, but that union actually kind of marks the end of his political influence. He's forced into exile after he gets into a quarrel with Nasser. Uh, you know, and definitely in the, in the 50s and 60s, you did not want to get on the wrong side of Nasser. I mean, that pretty much uh, would be the end of your career and perhaps the end of your life. Uh, but in any event, uh, as we pointed out, the union doesn't last very long. It ends in 1961. Syria is still fairly unstable at that point. And then finally, against that back, background, uh, we have effectively a military coup on March 8, 1963. A group of leftist army officers create a new government called the National Council of the Revolutionary Command. Uh, and it's made up of military and civilian officials, and it assumes control over, uh, over the country, all executive and legislative authority. Uh, the takeover is engineered by a political party that we haven't talked about yet uh, called the Arab Socialist Resurrection Party, uh, more commonly known as the Ba'ath Party. Some of you might have heard of that in connection with a fellow named Saddam Hussein. We'll get to him later. Uh, but this party actually had branches in many Arab countries, had been very active in Syria as well as Iraq uh, since the late 1940s. Uh, and so now in the case of Syria, they, they are going to become the dominant element in this new government, the new cabinet that's formed. So who are the Ba'ath? Who are the Ba'ath Party? Uh, again, the full name, Arab Socialist Resurrection Party, had been founded in 1947 uh, as a radical secular Arab nationalist political party. So uh, first of all, very much about pan-Arabism, about Arab nationalism uh, in support of you know, the unity of the Arab people. Uh, the socialist part of it, in a sense, uh, they really represent an attempt to come up with a kind of more palatable or acceptable form of communism, if you will, or socialism. Uh, you know, one, for instance, that wouldn't uh, be atheistic in outlook, kind of recognizing that religion uh, still remains an important aspect of people's lives in the Middle East. Uh, two would really try to promote the idea that socialism Right, in terms of looking out for the welfare of the community versus the individual, uh, was very compatible with Islamic values. Right? So they kind of try to promote this way of thinking about it. Uh, but it is really ultimately very secular. And we might note that uh, one of the two most important intellectual figures behind it was actually Christian, Michel Aflac, uh, the other one being Salah al-Din al-Bittar. Um, and so, again, right, you had, a, had branches in pretty much all of the Arab countries, but probably they were strongest in Syria and Iraq. And in fact, they came to power in both countries in the same year, in 1963. Uh, though that did raise kind of uh, an interesting issue, right, now that they actually held uh, power in two countries, and, and given that they supported the unity of the Arab people, you would expect that the first thing they would have done is try to create a kind of unified Syria and Iraq to create one uh, single country out of those two components. Uh, but you know, ambitious men don't like to share power. And in the end, uh, the Syrian and Iraqi parties split into two rival organizations, even if they both retain the same name, both known as the Ba'ath Party. Well, in the case of Syria, uh, so you know, this new government was in charge at the time of the Six Day War. Uh, and again, it was a humiliating defeat, first and foremost for Nasser, but it didn't bode well for any Arab government. Uh, and in this case, it kind of exacerbated a division that had already existed between the military wing of the Ba'ath Party, uh, which was much more radical, and a civilian wing, wing, which was much more moderate and which was now blamed for the defeat. Uh, and so this, you know, kind of making a long story short, eventually led to another military coup. This one bloodless that saw the Minister of Defense Hafiz al-Assad assume leadership uh, of the country uh, and uh, in the role of president, though effectively with dictatorial powers. And he would actually govern until his death 
in, uh, I believe it was 2000, maybe 2001, I forget. Uh, but by the way, his son is currently the head of the Syrian government and right now embroiled in a civil war, uh, Bashir al-Assad. So what about in Iraq? Well, prior to 63, Iraq had been one of the most western oriented uh, countries in the Middle East. Uh, so, you know, unlike Nasser, who kind of pursued this policy of non-alignment, Iraq decided to pick sides, and they went with, quote-unquote, the West, with Britain uh, and the United States. This was probably most evident in their prominent role in something called the Baghdad Pact, which was actually a military alliance. It was kind of initiated by the United States, but they actually never became part of it. So it was dominated by Great Britain. In theory, an anti-communist alliance, you know, the idea that, you know, if the Soviet Union were to invade uh, any of the countries that were part of the Baghdad Pact, uh, they would support one another and they could count on the support of Great Britain and the United States. Uh, so it's called the Baghdad Pact uh, because the kind of the headquarters for this uh, alliance is in Iraq, in Baghdad. It includes also Turkey, Iran, and Pakistan. Uh, but, you know, being pro-Western in the age of Pan-Arabism, when Nasser is such a prominent voice, kind of the hero of the Arab world, uh, comes uh, with a cost, right? And so Nasser, for instance, was very active in spreading propaganda in Iraq, uh, calling upon people to rise up against their government and overthrow it, right? For being too pro-Western, uh, for allying themselves with their former colonial master, Great Britain, and so forth. So this was, you know, being part of the Baghdad Pact, not a particularly popular thing. And sure enough, eventually you did have a military coup uh, initiated by the Free Officers, the same name used by Nasser and uh, his comrades when they had their military coup in Egypt. Uh, more specifically, it was the 19th Brigade. Uh, but, you know, they, they kind of named themselves after the original... Uh, coup that happened in Egypt. Uh, so this took place in 1958, right? So this is before the Ba'ath Party seizes power. The leaders of this coup were two fellows, Abdul Karim Qasim and Colonel Abdul Salam Arif. Uh, and, it, you know, it was pretty successful. Uh, the regime at that time uh, and the ruler at that time was, uh, well, really the regent, Abd al Ilah. Uh, technically acting on behalf of Faisal II, the grandson of the first Faisal. Uh, so a very unpopular regime. They're overthrown, and in fact, pretty much anyone associated with that regime is executed. One of the, the first acts of the new government is to withdraw from the Baghdad Pact, and eventually Qasim emerges as the true leader of the new regime. But it will prove short-lived. He's assassinated in February 1963, at which point, uh, as in Syria, the Ba'ath Party takes control of the government in the form of a revolutionary command council, sorry for the typo there, uh, under the leadership of one Ahmad Hassan al Uh And so he will be the dominant figure, though from a pretty early point, you have kind of, of a, a rising star in the Ba'ath Party, the Secretary General Saddam Hussein, uh, who will eventually become the main power, uh, initially kind of from behind the scenes, uh, operating in theory on behalf of al bakr but then eventually pushing him aside and, and taking direct control. And we'll stop there and pick up uh, the thread in the next lecture.